Good morning. We want to welcome you to Community Baptist Coedo's online service. If you're joining us for the very first time, we want to welcome you. So glad to have you with us here uh, worshiping. Uh, if you are just at home today, ha not able to make it, uh, we want to welcome you. you. You're greatly missed. And for those of you that just haven't had a chance to come back yet, uh, just well, keeping watch over your health and those different types of things. I just want you to know that we dearly miss each and every one of you. You are in our prayers. We can't wait for you to join us back and in person. Uh, and so just know that, that we miss you, that we love you, and that we're praying for you. Today, we're going to continue on in our study through the book of Hebrews together in our series entitled greater than, where we've been looking at the greatness of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, compared to all things and to all people. Today, we come to the ninth chapter. We're going to study out together uh, the entire chapter number nine this morning, and that really brings us to the completion of two-thirds of this book. We are two-thirds of the way through the epistle uh, to the Hebrews, and so it's been a great joy of mine to just study this and to, to preach and walk through this with each and every one of you. And I pray it's been a blessing to you and your family just as much as it has been a blessing to me and to mine as well. You, last week, we looked at the greater mediator, uh, part one, and really focused in on the fact that Jesus Christ is our great high priest, that he is the mediator between a holy and a perfect God and sinful man, that he is ultimately the bridge maker. He is the one that bridges the gap that is created between man and God by our sin, the brokenness that was brought into this world uh, caused by the rebellion of man against God and how Jesus Christ is that bridge. And we looked at the reality that that bridge is perfect, and that bridge is permanent, and that bridge is personal. And what we're going to find in chapter 9, uh, very similar to what we found in chapter 7 and 8, and also what we'll find in chapter 10, is that the author of Hebrews really starts to develop this idea of the perfect, permanent, and personal bridge, uh, Jesus Christ as our great high priest. And we see this play out in chapter 9 as well. In verse 11, we see that uh, the bridge, our great high priest, is, is perfect. In verse 11, we see that uh, as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is not of this creation. We also see in verse 14 of the perfection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, our great high priest, it says that he offered himself without blemish to God. We see uh, that the bridge, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, is permanent in this chapter, just as we saw in chapter 7 and 8 as well. In verse 12, we see that he entered once for all, that it's not a continual uh, uh, sacrifice that Jesus Christ has to make. Uh, verse 15 says that as a result of him being the mediator of a new covenant, that those who have called upon him have received the promised eternal inheritance. That's a permanent inheritance. It can't be eternal if you can lose it. And so we see the permanency of our great high priest and the covenant that he has established for those that will repent and place their faith in him. Verse 25, we see this reality of permanency and him being the permanent bridge as well. Uh, it says, nor was it to offer himself repeatedly. He didn't have to offer himself repeatedly. Verse 26 says that he has appeared once for all. And we also see that the bridge that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ makes for us, is for us, as our great high priest, is also personal. Verse 24 says, For Christ has entered not only into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, and now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. That there's that personal relationship that we see that has been made and developed by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in his sacrificial death and atonement for our sins on the cross. Verse 28 speaks of this personal relationship as well. So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, the, the many is all those that have placed their faith in Christ Jesus, although compared to those that are walking on the broad road of destruction, and the reality is there's not as many as compared to those that are going their own way, which will end in death. 
says will appear a second time, not to deal with the sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. And that ultimately is all those that have placed their faith and trust in Christ Jesus. And so we see this play out throughout this ninth chapter as well, that the author of Hebrews is reiterating these realities that Jesus Christ is perfect, that Jesus Christ and the new covenant that he establishes is permanent. And that Jesus Christ uh, establishes a personal relationship with all those that come to him in faith. In Hebrews uh, chapter 9, the first five verses, we see that the author of Hebrews is is going to really uh, take somewhat of a side trip into showing the old sacrificial system to these individuals who have come to faith in Christ Jesus that, that were Jews that that followed the laws of Judaism, but have come to faith in Christ Jesus, are starting to face persecution, are tempted to go back to that old sacrificial system to try to find peace, to try to find joy, to try to find truth, and to try to find reality. He is showing them the uh, inadequacy and the insufficiency of that sacrificial system. And so in verses uh, 9, 1 through 5, God's word says, Now even the first covenant had regulations for worship in an earthly place of holiness. For a tent was prepared, the first section in which were the lampstand and the table and the bread of the presence. It is called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a second section called the most holy place, having the golden altar of incense and the ark of the covenant, covered on all sides with gold, in which was a golden urn holding the manna and Aaron's staff that budded and the tablets of the covenant. Above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we can now not speak in detail. Now the author of Hebrews knows that they understand exactly what it is he's talking about. They understand what it is that he's mentioning in verses 6 and 7. He's going to jump in and he's really going to be hearkening to uh, the Day of Atonement and the tabernacle in the wilderness and, and how those uh, individuals worship God uh, in that time and in that day. And so uh, as he establishes that with them, he does so briefly because they know in detail what it is that he is talking about. He says in verse 5, above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we can now not speak in detail. Well, They didn't need to because his audience understood exactly what he was referencing. For us, we don't necessarily have as innate of an understanding or understand each detail that is mentioned here. Some may, but some may not. And ultimately, just as we saw in chapter 7 and 8, that those things were copies, those things were shadow. We see that this is an earthly place of holiness, but there is a, a, a true heavenly place to which the tabernacle was made as a mere copy and a mere shadow of the true substance of things. And so we see that all throughout the Old Testament are those Easter eggs, like we see in movies that are pointing forward and giving nods to certain other aspects that may arise further on on in the storyline, we see in the Old Testament that there are many Easter eggs that point to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There are nods to his coming. There are uh, things that will be revealed and developed as the New Testament is unfolded and the life of Jesus Christ is shown to us through uh, uh, God being incarnate uh, through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so we see many types here in what is being described. Uh, for a tent was prepared, the first section in which were uh, the, the lamp stand. And uh, the lamp stand, really, uh, it, it's, it's not a candle stand. They didn't really use candles because they used oil uh, to burn. And uh, it was a massive uh, piece of uh, pure gold that was fashioned and shaped. It, it's what the menorah looks like. In fact, it, it, this is a, a replica that has been made that sits in a square in Jerusalem ready to be used in the third temple when it is built and it is created. I had an opportunity when I was in Israel and looking at uh, the city of Jerusalem and all of uh, the the beautiful places uh, where we read about in scripture to see this and to take this picture. And and this would have been in uh, the, the, the holy place. It would have been behind the first curtain outside of the gate as you uh, entered in. In fact, I think we have a view of exactly what the tabernacle would have looked like. 
The worshiper would have entered through this gate, could go no further than the courtyard. Here was the, the altar uh, to burn the sacrifices. It had four horns on each. It had a horn on each corner that they would tie the, the sacrifice to. There was a, a basin here where the priests would wash and cleanse themselves. And then they would enter into this curtain right here into the place called the holy place. And inside the holy place would have been the lampstand that is mentioned, would have been the table for the showbread where the 12 pieces of bread, one for each tribe, would have been placed on this table and then would have been the golden altar of incense. This curtain right here would have come all the way across and only one day out of the year would anyone be allowed to go in there? And that's where the Ark of the Covenant was in the Shekinah glory of God Almighty, where he had chosen to dwell with his people would have uh, been. And so we see that all of these things that are being mentioned by the author of Hebrews point us to Jesus. Uh, Jesus is the true light of the world. There were no windows in the tabernacle. So you can imagine how dark it would have been without that light. And without Jesus Christ, there is darkness that exists in our life. He is the bread of life where the showbread would have been. He is the bread of life. Uh, the, the incense and the, the golden altar of incense, it speaks of the reality of, of the worship and how he is the, the high priest as it speaks of the reality of the Ark of the Covenant as well and the contents of it. Aaron's butted uh, a rod, but it's staff. Well, Jesus Christ is the full bloomed high priest that is fully developed and is greater than the line of Aaron, is greater than Aaron, greater than Moses. We've seen all of those realities play out. The, 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 ta the tablets that had the Ten Commandments would have been in the Ark of the Covenant. Well, Jesus Christ is uh, the perfection of the law. He has fulfilled the law. He has perfected it completely. And again, talking of the manna, he is the bread of life. And so we see even when you go back to the, the outer courtyard view uh, that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, like the basin is the living water that cleanses us. Uh, we see at the, the altar where the sacrifices would be made that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is the ultimate sacrifice that cleanses us of our sins and atones for our sins. And so what is mentioned in, in verses uh, six and seven is really a description of what takes place on the day of atonement. That one day out of the year where the high priest would walk uh, through the curtain and go into the holy of holies. And, and on that day, we, we would see these events taking place. Now, this is just one day. This is the Day of Atonement. This was a, a, a major day in the life of those that were uh, followers uh, uh, of God that, that lived in uh, the, the Jewish faith uh, in the days where they were going to the tabernacle, uh, the days of the temple as well. But uh, they have in mind the tabernacle in the wilderness here. But the, the, the high priest would, would wake up on the Day of Atonement and he would wash himself, he would cleanse himself, and then he would put on his priestly robes the royal looking robes with the ephod and the, the breastplate and, and all of the gold and the jewels that were attached to it. And he would go about his morning duties and uh, then he would make the morning sacrifices, a sacrifice a bull, seven lambs and a ram. And then he would wash again. He would cleanse for the second time. He'd wash himself for the second time and put on all white linen, a, a white linen tunic with white undergarments. And that linen tunic would be seamless, just like our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ when he was crucified. You remember that uh, the Roman soldiers, they gambled for his clothes. And I believe firmly that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was, was hung on the cross in complete nakedness and a naked uh, shame that, that he went to the cross and they took everything uh, off of him and they gambled for a seamless tunic. Again, a, a foreshadowing, a picture of the reality, the fulfillment of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ being the great high priest. And he would put on those white linen garments, and then he would take a bull that he had bought with his own resources. He would put his hands on the head of that bull, and he would confess his sins and the sins of his family over that bull. He would then go and he would take out of this patch these two golden pieces that had the name of Jehovah on one and the name of Azazel on the other. And then he would pull it out, and whichever one that he pulled out, he would uh, come to the first goat, and if it was for Jehovah, then he would mark that, that goat with 
a, 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 a piece of, of string, a thread around that goat. And if it was for Aziazel, which really means scapegoat, it would take a crimson piece of wool, a thread, and wrap it around its horns. He would leave the goats at that point in time for a moment, and he would sacrifice the bull. He would take some of the blood and it would be collected in a basin and another priest would stir it so it wouldn't congeal. And then he would go, he would take um, some coals uh, from the altar and he would take some incense and he would go into the holy place and he would pour that incense on those coals at the altar of incense to make a a cloud of incense. Uh, And then he would step back out into the courtyard and he would get some of the bull's blood and he would put it on the mercy seat. Then he would go back to the goat that had uh, Jehovah uh, marked on it and he would uh, sacrifice that goat. And then he would take uh, the that goat and he would go in and he would do the same thing on the mercy seat. He would come back out, get the bull's blood and the goat's blood, mix it together and then uh, sprinkle it on the altar of incense. And then he would come back and on the altar itself, he would put that blood. Then the high priest took his hand and put it on the head of the goat that had been marked as the scapegoat, confessed his sins and the sins of the people over it. Another priest would take that goat and leave it out into the wilderness. Now, the the thing that would happen, remember, it had a crimson wool uh, thread uh, tied to its horn. Uh, After a while, sometimes, you know, the the goats knew where they would be fed. It was like any pet or any animal, it would return back. It would come back to the camp. And so it would be a picture of what was supposed to be completely forgiven. Sometimes those goats would wander back into the camp. So they took it upon themselves that afterwards they would just throw the goat off of the cliff so the goat wouldn't come back. Now, the beauty of the sacrifice of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is our sin doesn't come back. Our sin is forgiven. It's been taken out. It's been paid for in full. But they would take the scapegoat out and they would release the scapegoat. And the scapegoat would go out into the wilderness or off a cliff later on. Uh, Then the high priest would take the bull and the the goat and sacrifice it completely. Uh, He would wash again. Then he would uh, change back into the royal robes, do his evening sacrifices. Then he would wash again. He would change back into the white linen garments. He would remove the incense that was burning on the altar. Uh, He would wash for a fifth time, or or excuse me, he would remove the evening incense. He would do uh, the trimming of the lampstand, and then he was done. So he would wash five times that day, uh, and he would sacrifice uh, all of these different animals throughout this ritual. And I'm tired of just, just explaining all that. Imagine what that day looked like. Uh, for uh, the the high priest and for the people. And they had to do that every year. Once a year, they had to go through that for the cleansing of God's people. Uh, Now, throughout the year, they were having to do other sin sacrifices constantly. So we see in Hebrews 9, 6 through 7, we we see the, the, the fact that this reality or this bridge that was given to them by God really was to show them their need for the greater bridge, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Because in verse 6, we see these preparations having thus been made, the priests go regularly into the first section. So we see that it's not permanent. This bridge isn't permanent. It's temporary. They have to do it over and over and over again. In fact, we see in verse 7 that on the Day of Atonement, it had to be done once a year. It wasn't a one-time sacrifice like our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ on the cross. It was something that had to be done once a year. And so it was temporary, not permanent. We also see that it wasn't personal. In verse 7, it says, but into the, into the second uh, uh, area, only the high priest goes. So it wasn't that everybody had access to the presence of God Almighty, but ultimately the only one that could go into the Holy of Holies was a high priest. And so we see that that bridge was not personal and we see that wasn't permanent. And we also see that it was not perfect. In verse nine, we see that reality that says, according to this arrangement, gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect the conscience of the worshiper. It it cannot perfect it. Where our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ does that, uh, the bridge that was the sacrificial system of the Old Testament 
uh, could not do that. And ultimately, the, the, the sacrificial system of the Old Testament, it, it wasn't that in and of itself it was insufficient because it actually was accomplishing what God desired for it to accomplish. It wasn't that God made a mistake. What God was trying to show them and us was that uh, we couldn't do it. Uh, he was showing us our great need for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that ultimately, the Old Testament sacrificial system and the law was to point us to the, the true substance. The shadows and the copies were to point us to the true substance. The law was to point us to our great need for, for grace. Now, we also see that it's not the system being broken in the Old Testament, but it's the revelation that it brings us to of the brokenness of man, that man is broken. We see in verse 7 that it says, but into the second only the high priest goes, but he once a year and not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the unintentional sins of the people. But on the day of atonement, they were only atoning for the unintentional sins of the people. Those that willingly and volitionally sinned against God, they, they still had that sin on them. It, they were called sins of the high hand, as Numbers chapter 15 would refer to. Numbers 15, verses 30 through 31 says, But the person who does anything with the high hand, intentionally, volitionally, rebels against God, knowingly, whether he is native or a sojourner, reviles the Lord. And that person shall be caught off from among his people because he has despised the word of the Lord and has broken his commandment. That person shall be utterly cut off. His iniquity shall be on him. In other words, the, the, what was the hope? What was the answer for those individuals that willingly sin? It wasn't the day of atonement because what those were pointing to was something far greater. Now, I believe that God has given uh, special revelation over the years in various ways and dispensations. And ultimately, that what we see is that in the Old Testament, uh, there was an understanding of a Messiah. There was an understanding of something greater than the Old Testament sacrificial system. That's what Psalm 51 is all about. When you think about David and his sin with Bathsheba, and the murdering of Uriah, uh, you think about, about that. That was a volitional sin. That was a high-handed sin. He willingly sinned, and he understood that. In Psalm 51, we see the recognition of David in that. In Psalm 51, verses 1 through 3, David writes, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. He says, I can't get rid of it. I need you to wash me of it. I know that I have sinned against you. Ultimately, I've sinned against you and you alone. He will go on to say in Psalm 51, uh, verses 16 through 17, this reality, for you will not delight in sacrifice. I, I can't wait till the day of atonement. I can't take a bull. I can't take a goat or I would give it. You will not be pleased with the burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart. Oh, God, will you not despise me? What, what a beautiful picture David points to and shows us of the understanding that the blood of the bulls and the goats could not perfectly satisfy the brokenness of man within. But we need to understand that we have to be broken over our sin. That's what true repentance is. Far too often, individuals have come to the point where their sin isn't that big of a deal to them anymore. They may acknowledge, yeah, that, 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 that I shouldn't have done that, but where's the brokenness of man's heart over sin? As, as a follower of God Almighty, our sin ought to break our heart. We ought to be on our knees and on our face each and every morning, each and every day, crying out to God, acknowledging our sin against him, being broken over our sin, being a desiring to live a life that is holy and pleasing to him. But unfortunately, within the church today, it's, it's, it's okay to be a friend with sin. 
And notice I didn't say it's okay to be a friend with sinners. That's what God has called us to do is to speak truth in the life of those individuals. But somehow the church has misconstrued it to say it's okay to be a sinner. It's okay to live your life however you want. As long as you profess the name of Christ, as long as you wear crosses, as long as you show up to church ever so often, then live your life however you want to. Where is the brokenness of God's people over their sin? We look at the result of the lack of God's people broken over their sin all around us. The church has become comfortable with sin. Christians have become comfortable with their own sin. But David was broken over his own sin. And he was looking in eager anticipation to the Christ that was going to come and pay for his sin. And so we've seen over these last few chapters and last week and uh, so far this week, we, we've seen this, this reality of who the bridge is, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, what the bridge is, uh, the, the, the one that bro- broaches the chasm for us. Uh, but how, does, how did it get formed? How did it get laid? And ultimately, it was by the blood of Christ, the blood of Christ. Look, chapter 9 of Hebrews is, is a bloody chapter. Far too often, I think we want to gloss over, Jesus Christ went to the cross for my sin. Jesus Christ died a brutal death for your sin and for my sin. A brutal death. And far too often, we want the the breakthrough or we want the blessing without the blood. There is no blessing, there is no breakthrough without the blood of Jesus Christ. We want the grace without the gore. He literally had the flesh of his back ripped off by cat and eye tails. His beard plucked out. He was beaten to the point that he was unrecognizable. He was nailed to a cross. He had a spear driven through his side. We want the crown without the cross. But the reality is that There is no breakthrough. There is no blessing without blood. There is no grace without the gore of the cross. There is no crown without the cross. He says, deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow after me. You see, there's nothing as powerful as the blood of Jesus Christ. The blood of Jesus Christ, it redeems us. It rights our wrongs, it removes our sins, it it relocates us, and it reconciles us. We see all of these realities play out in Scripture. In Ephesians 1, 7, we see that the blood of Christ, it it redeems us, that we are redeemed by the blood of Christ. In Romans 5, 9, we see that the blood of Christ justifies us, or it rights us, it gives us a right standing before God Almighty. In 1 John 1, 7, it says the blood of Christ removes sin from us, that it cleanses us of all of our sin. In Ephesians 2.13, we see that the blood of Christ relocates us. It says those that were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ Jesus, that it relocates us. It brings us into a, a close personal relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The blood of Christ reconciles us, Colossians 1.19 speaks of. The idea that not only are we given a right standing before God and justified, but we have been brought into that personal relationship, that we now have that established, that he has reconciled us, that what was once lost has now been found, that those that were blind now see, and all of that is a reality established by the blood of Jesus Christ, as we see in Hebrews 9 verse 12. It says, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. We are redeemed by the blood that was shed on the cross by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It wasn't bulls. It wasn't goats. We weren't uh, bought with things that were perishable, but the imperishable, the precious, holy spotless lamb who takes away the sins of the world. So we see the brokenness of man, and the answer for the brokenness of man was Jesus Christ and the blood that he spilled on our behalf to atone for our sins and to reconcile us and to redeem us, uh, to right us before God, to remove our sins and to relocate us into a close proximity and personal relationship with him. Chapter 9 also goes on to, to show the, not only the reality of the brokenness of man and 
the power of the blood of Christ, but also the blessed hope of the church. I don't know about you, but I'm so thankful for the hope that I have in Christ Jesus. I remember many days in my life living completely hopeless, feeling completely helpless. But in this verse, I I see not only the reality of the hope that I have in a high priest that is constantly interceding for me, but also a high priest that is returning to come and take me to his eternal kingdom. Verse 27 and 28 of chapter 9 says this, And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes the judgment. We've talked about this all throughout our study of Hebrews. That everybody upon their death is going to face judgment. Some at the Bema Seat of Christ where they will receive their rewards. Some at the great white throne of judgment where the book of life will be opened and all of those who are not written it will go before God in their own righteousness and by their own works. And because they have sinned and are not perfect, they will be separated from God for eternity. And so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, amen, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. The next great event in the life of the church is the rapture. I believe that we will have a front row seat to this reality that Jesus Christ comes and he takes his church and and brings that church with him into the present heaven, that he's not coming back to deal with sin. That's already been dealt with on the cross. Sin has already been dealt with on the cross. And if you place your faith in Christ Jesus then your sin has been dealt with, but if you reject Jesus Christ, then that sin has no other hope or no other answer, and you will stand before God completely on your own, and you will remain separated from him for eternity. But this is the blessed hope of the church, that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is coming back. In fact, we're going to be looking at this very in-depth Uh, realities and truths of exactly what this is when it talks about that he will appear. Look, that's really the the idea of the the second coming or or advent that we're going to be looking at as we get close to to Christmas. And there are really four marks of an advent, uh, the reality that we are in a waiting room. That's exactly what we'll be looking at when we go into our Advent series. The title of that series is going to be The Waiting Room. What should the life of a believer look like as we live out our faith in between the reality that Christ came in the flesh, born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, died, was buried, resurrected, ascended into heaven, and the reality that he is going to come back again. There are four marks of every believer that should be displayed in everyone's life to a lost and dying world. Should be hope, first and foremost, the hope of this reality, the hope of the reality that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is coming back, that this world isn't all there is. Peace. There should be a peace of the understanding that sin has been dealt with in the life of each and every believer and love because he first loved us, we are to love others, and then lastly, joy. That our lives ought to be marked with joy. It it burdens me and it troubles my heart to see so many individuals that are followers of Christ Jesus so bogged down that they have not one ounce of joy in their life. We're saved. We're redeemed. We've been justified. We've been brought near. We're children of the most high God. We're ambassadors of Christ Jesus. We have eternal life. We have the kingdom of God awaiting each and every one of us. We have a Lord and Savior in heaven who's going to come back for us. There ought to be joy in each and every one of our lives. And so while we remain here with each and every breath that we have in our lungs, we see the reality of what our bliss should be, the bliss of every believer. Chapter 9 shows us what the joy ought to be what that bliss ought to be in the life of each and every believer. And it's, it's not the things that we can get from Christ. It's the fact that we have a relationship with him first and foremost, but listen to what it says in verses 13 through 14. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, look, if that does that, 
How much more with the blood of Christ who the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God purify our conscience from dead works. Now here's ought to be the bless, the bliss of every believer. That we have been purified from dead works to serve the living God. That it ought to be a great joy to serve the living God each and every day. That we wake up to find a way to serve him, to, to, to proclaim him, to glorify him. That ought to be the joy in the life of each and every believer. Do you find joy in serving the Lord? And if not, that ought to be a check engine light. That ought to be a heart check right then and there to say, why is it I am not receiving joy from serving the Lord? The one who died on a cross for me, who came to serve and not be served and willingly allowed himself to be a sacrifice on the cross so that my sins could be forgiven. I could be made a child of his, be brought into his forever family and given the privilege and the honor to be called his ambassador here on this earth so that I could proclaim his goodness until the day that he returns. There ought to be joy in our lives to be servants of the living God. Now, on that day of atonement that I spoke of earlier where all of those sacrifices had to be made, when the high priest went into the Holy of Holies for the the, the very first time, and he came out, while he was in there, there, there was an understanding between the people and him that you need to hurry. Because we need to see that God is approving of what it is that we're doing and that, that God hasn't killed you. You, you need to you know, hurry up and show us that God is receiving our worship. And they would wait with bated breath for him to appear. And when he would appear, there would be this collective sigh that was like a gush of, uh, of wind that all of the people saw the high priest emerge and appear. And there was this collective relief, collective joy, collective elation. We all had at one point in time in our life a desire to see a Savior appear, to fix the brokenness, to heal all of the pain, to take all of the junk, to remove all of the darkness, to provide purpose and meaning for our life. Now listen to verse 11 of chapter 9. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come. Now you can breathe been holding your breath, waiting for a savior, waiting for an answer, waiting for healing, waiting for that brokenness of your life to be dealt with, waiting for whoever that is to appear on the scene. And you've been putting your, your faith and you've been putting your trust and, and somebody else or something else. And they, they haven't shown up yet. I want you to understand they never will. As much as they may make a promise, they never will because God does not receive them in any kind of way to be the one to be the answer for the eternal problem that exists in your life, the brokenness that exists in your life, the pain that exists in your life. But we see in verse 11, but when Jesus Christ appeared, our great high priest of the good things, that ought to bring us great relief. All of those burdens that we've been carrying can let them go because our Savior has appeared. After that high priest on the Day of Atonement would have finished doing all of the sacrifices for that day, after he cleansed himself for the last time, you know what he would do? He would go home and he would prepare a feast and the people would come and gather around the, the, the home of the high priest and they would enjoy a feast there because God had received all of their sacrifices. That God had blessed them through their obedience to what it is that he had laid before them, they would come and they would, have a, uh, they would have a feast with the great high priest. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ has completed the sacrifice. It only took one and it only happened once. 
he went home and he's, re he's preparing a feast for each and every individual that has placed their faith in him. And one day, he's going to come and get us. He's going to bring us home. And we're going to sit around in the great wedding feast that the Lord has prepared underneath the banner marked love. And we will experience eternal life with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There's no greater joy. And I pray if you have not experienced that joy, that right here, right now, you would place your faith in Jesus Christ. Just give it to him. He is your sacrifice. He's the light of the world. He's the living water. He's the bread of life. He's the fulfillment of the law. He is the Savior that has appeared. Place your faith and trust in him and allow him to change your life. Right where you're at, right there. Maybe you pray this prayer with me. Gracious Heavenly Father, God, just as the high priest would put their, their hands on an animal, Lord, I put my hands on the head of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, I confess that I am a sinner. I confess that I have no ability in and of myself to save myself. The best way I know how, I'm asking Jesus to save me. Lord, I believe that he is the Savior who has appeared. I believe that he died for my sins. I believe that he was buried, but on the third day he rose from the grave, defeating sin and death. And this day I confess him to be the Lord and the Savior of my life. God, thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.